Thank you, and let's just bow as we transition from this time. Father, I thank you for the opportunity it is to praise you, to lift our voices together. Thank you for those who have prepared and led us, and for the blessing it is to be in your presence with your people this evening. Speak to our hearts. Use each one who has a part in the ministry here to uh, be available to your spirit. Not just limited to those who stand up in front, but uh, as we, your body, your, your people, gather together in your name, may it be a time where your spirit is working. And so we thank you for your word. We thank you for the good news that we have about gospel message and, and a life to offer to a world that is in such disrepair. We're so broken by sin. And so we again, we give you the praise that you are that awesome, holy, powerful, wonderful God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And as we uh, are still rejoicing in what we were able to experience last, last Sunday when the clouds parted and we as a church gathered together, I hope you were able to see pictures of not before I try to have them running again afterwards put into a uh, slideshow that shows pictures from the picnic and the baptisms and things that were uh, taking place. Uh, there will be another picnic in the uh, first Sunday of August, might be the first of August. And uh, especially for those that are uh, wanting to do it in a more natural way, and sit the means maybe in the ocean or, or a body of water here, but that that will be a chance. But this large structure over here is the is a gift from a church in Milwaukee, Oregon, or south of Portland. Uh, back in March, when we were the meeting, there was an announcement made of a church that had a portable baptistry to give away. So uh, we're a little ways away yet from from being able to use it, but uh, but it does provide for us the opportunity with. Uh, Mild temperatures in the water, or we could put ice water in it and uh, <laughs> make it consistent and with uh, what others have experienced. But uh, but really, the more important thing is those people who stand before others to say, "I put my trust in Jesus Christ, and I'm publicly identifying myself as one of His people, and to follow Him." It's something uh, that uh, parents are to be teaching and training their children in it. Uh, and I just to get, be part of the, the exciting moments when, uh, when these things take place. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, we enjoy is the fellowship with God's people, but it's not just a fellowship that uh, is limited to uh, this church. Now, we are doing everything we can to build relationships within uh, the body. Because we meet at two different times, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And, and that's why I uh, had said last a week ago, I really would encourage you, you know, not because you want to have a fun picnic, but make it your purpose to get to know others that are a part of this, this fellowship. And uh, we'll do everything we can to facilitate that, but it's, uh, it's important for us to, to recognize that we're not ever all together at one time. I have seven children. I've never had them all in my own house at the same time. But that's a little bit unusual. We've been all together, once in Seattle and once in Portland, but uh, someone's always been gone. And, uh, and it's that way as a uh, church family. Uh, but still, we, we want to uh, help build those connections that people have with each other. But we also have a relationship with uh, us a sisterhood, you might say, of churches that are here in the state, and I have interaction with, with those other leaders, a pastor in, uh, in North Pole or in Fairbanks, and I'll be going in August back at Ellen and I to United Peninsula, where the church we pastored back in the 80s is celebrating a 60th anniversary, and so there'll be a, a gathering there, but this next week I'll be going to Juneau. There's a man who's come up from Washington starting a new church in Juneau, and uh, his name is Mike Wright, and he's with a, a network of church planters that's called Acts 29, 
It's the same network that my son-in-law and daughter, Brian and Lisa Holt, are working with in uh, uh, Walla Walla, but it's also, they're also a part of our CB Northwest uh, Association as well. Well, I talk to these other pastors, and, uh, and we pray for the right ones there in the middle, but there are my next door neighbors, and not, I've never been over there even to, to uh, meet with them face to face. So after the service tomorrow, Carolyn and I are getting on the ferry, and we'll be in this next week. Be back on Friday, so I'll be back to this next weekend again. Now, uh, one of the things that also is taking place, just for your information, is that uh, while my son Scott, a school teacher, also has a building uh, construction company on the side, he's headed up a certain phase here with the framing, and for three weeks he's worked very diligently. Uh, but he also is in the process of selling his house and moving out out of that house, and uh, so it was a busy week leading up to last weekend, but at that point, they've moved in with us. So uh, we are enjoying having our uh, son and daughter-in-law and three grandchildren living in the house with us. Now we have uh, some empty bedrooms, and it's worked out. Uh, he's planning to build his own house, but right now the site is still being developed, so it's going to be a little ways off, and so uh, we enjoy having having family around, but uh, hopefully they will enjoy being around us <laughs> as much as we continue forward on that. But, uh, but do pray for our fellowship of churches. There's uh, an under pastor who I, who I met when he was still in seminary in Portland when I was down there in January. And we, as our fellowship here at the CBA of Alaska, have been looking for those whose hearts would stir them toward ministry here, and, uh, and so uh, I was able to find someone there at the same school that, that I graduated from that uh, was hoping to, to minister, and turns out he's already been, been coming and doing some uh, commercial fishing on a second site over in Megagate for the last, last five or six years. He has a last experience, so it's uh, Dakota Bartlett was named. It's his name, his wife is Melanie, and they have three little boys. Well, we happen to have taken over a church, one of our sister churches in Anchorage, closed and has a uh, church building there that we have had an uh, agreement to sell to a North Star Assembly of God group that was meeting there, but they weren't able to follow through with the purchase, so we, we were getting back. It has a little parsonage that is in marginal. Well, that's maybe making it sound too good condition there. And so uh, so these things that don't so much pertain to the everyday life here are also part of what Stuart and I relate to in, in ministry here in leadership. Well, uh, uh, Dakota and Melanie are returning back to Anchorage to really now get started with their church planning work. And, uh, and it appears that rather than uh, having them live in this parsonage, they'll be looking for a rental house. I I got a call from the North Pole pastor who said, I've got to make a decision in about 10 minutes. And uh, they had a group that were about to leave to come down and work on this house that would come in and, and we'd have serious reservations whether we'd even want to put them in this place. See, these are the types of things that are, are not all about us here, but other people's lives. The work of the gospel in, in, in Alaska, in this case in Anchorage. I can uh, readily identify with where he is because uh, when I graduated from school, we moved to a place that started a church and realized that it was nice while we were in Portland and all our friends in our church were saying, oh, hey, yeah, that's, that's great work that you're doing. But they came up, we were actually there in Utah, Oregon, and uh, we had two little children and how are we going to do this? We felt very much alone at that point. And uh, it's always uh, a great thing for us to be able to come alongside and say, you're not alone because we're praying for you. Uh, we're here to support and, uh, and partner with you. And so I'm talking about a little bit more than I usually do, but I do want you to be aware that in Chill and in Anchorage right now, there's two, two new churches being started that we have, here at Grace Harbor have a, have a special relationship so uh, I'll be talking to you about the Ridings and, and Juno and the Bartlows and Anchorage and consider them part of the family. And uh, we can be the, the stronger, the, the, the big brother, so to speak, to, to come alongside and help. Uh, let this be a, a, an 
issue of prayer for us. So uh, with that, let's go to the Lord tonight. Lord, we do thank you that you have given us the opportunity to, to be entrusted with the gospel and that you are in the process of, of, of bringing that together out of the, the people of this world, a group of people, your church, your body, the bride for whom Jesus Christ comes one day as the bridegroom. May we be faithful, even as we look at your word here shortly and see how this relates to things yet in the future. We pray that we will be faithful doing what you have instructed us to do. Invest in our lives knowing that we are the temporary here, that our eternal home, our citizenship, is there with you. So uh, we pray for Dakota and Naomi Barton and their three little boys. We pray that uh, they would have a successful and profitable ending to the fishing season for the year, even though it hasn't been what we had hoped. I pray that you would <coughs> guide them to the right place, to the right people, and may we as a church here in Sitka be able to be partnering together, not only to strengthen and help them, but investing with them to, to also share in that fruit and blessing and reward that comes as we step out in faith. I pray to you for the folks over in Juno, and may there be a, a closer relationship that we can have with them. And I, I pray for Mike Ryan and, and his wife that you encourage them. I pray to you for uh, those in our church with special need right now to think of Mary Stevens there in Wisconsin who learned this past week that uh, this is in fact lung cancer that she has and, and now she's getting the medical uh, 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 examinations and, uh, and determination of, of where to go with treatment. I pray that you will uh, encourage her. Thank you for, for that faith and confidence she also displays. Thank you for bringing you nothing back and as he too will, will face some treatment in the future, I, I ask that you, you guide and establish in man in their hearts. I know that there are young people that are facing special challenges right now. Some of those that are extra students that are back in villages where, where they're facing testing and, and uh, the enemy is trying to uh, cause them to fall. We pray that they will be strengthened. Your spirit would uphold them and uh, the truth of your word would be recalled and they, they rest and be, be dependent upon you. I pray now that you would uh, guide us in our consideration this evening and these things that are before us. I ask that you would enable your spirit in that which uh, is good. And, and it's part of your word and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I wrote to you, there's those times when uh, I get caught by surprise and say, well, I didn't see this coming. But here is something in Matthew chapter 24 that we ought to be able to say otherwise. That uh, the Lord says, even so when you see all these things, that, that there is something being described to us that we can say that we see coming. Now, we covered the first uh, part of that, uh, a lengthy passage, last weekend in, in the study where Jesus gave instructions that, that spelled out those events of the, uh, relating primarily to the tribulation period. But now he's going to, in this passage here, use three figures to give some application to it. And those three figures, namely, are, are first of all, a fig tree, and, uh, and there's a lesson you learn from a fig tree. Then he's also going to speak of Noah. Not that Noah. Mm -hmm. This Noah. And uh, he is going to uh, say that there's something about Noah and his day that gives us instruction as well. And then a nighttime thief. Now of those three figures, we are going to be uh, considering here this evening. So let's first read the passage and then we'll consider it. Jesus says, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, 
When you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And so let's look at these uh, three figures here tonight, the first of them being the fig tree. And as we recognize, and Jesus is explaining here, in what we call the Olivet Discourse, it's in the final week of his ministry, it's after Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, and uh, the next thing that you're going to see is the conspiring of Judas and the, and the betrayal. And so uh, he's just a couple days now from, from the cross. He's giving this uh, detailed and lengthy discourse, called the Olivet Discourse, because he's on the Mount of Olives, just off right to the side of the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. And first of all, he says, uh, now that I've explained and laid out the events, here's some things that you will do in application. He says, learn this lesson from the fig tree. And the whole point of the fig tree is that shortly before Christ's return, believers will see predicted events. When the fig branch puts forth leaves, he's saying only a short time remains until summer. Well, the fig tree in the Bible is often a picture of Israel. You find it in Hosea 9, you find it in Luke 13. And as he's describing, these are things that are going to happen yet in the future. Sometimes the, the shadow falls forward. And before the event actually occurs, there will be some sort of indication of what is coming up. We put this in a historical framework of God. Again, I'll, I'll put up this diagram that I used last weekend. First of all, in a, in a long face here, you see the top line representing God's eternal kingdom, no beginning, no ending, a God who it says, I am. And uh, then Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, referred to a time before creation when one of his leading angels, Lucifer, led a revolt in Satan, being lifted up with pride. Sin entered, entered at that point, and uh, Satan, or Lucifer, as his angelic name was, were, was cast out of heaven and uh, began a uh, campaign of opposition against God. God began something new. We started in Genesis 1 with a kingdom here on earth, a kingdom that would be led by, by he himself. We call it a theocratic or a theocracy. But nevertheless, there would be uh, various stages in its development. He put people here who lived in innocence. Innocence ended in Genesis 3 when Satan came and brought that sin that, uh, from his kingdom and introduced it into our race. And, and God's creation then had a curse. And as the Bible Romans tells us, is still groaning under that curse. There was then a uh, conscience that spoke, there was uh, the flood, and, uh, and then the 
the establishment of human government. There was Abraham and the promise. We call these dispensations. And we find in Romans that those did not end, but we still have the witness of conscience that uh, convicts us before God. We still have God establishing human government. And God's promise to Abraham has not been set aside. Romans tells us all these things. But about 1400 or 1440 B.C., we have uh, Moses. And after leaving Egypt, God established a period of law. And they were, God's people were under the dispensation of law. Not as a means of salvation, but rather to show their need of their salvation. And uh, that was fulfilled, as we see in Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians at, at the cross. And ended that period of time. God sent his son, born under the law, to redeem those that are under the law. And while Christ was on earth, he said, we read Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Will meaning future. It's not something he had been doing, but something he was about to start. In fact, we see the beginning of that church shortly after his ascension. The ascension is in Acts 1 and Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, is the birth of the church. The church, too, is a mystery that was hidden from none of the godly people of the Old Testament knew about this uh, thing that God was going to do, bringing Jew and Gentile together into one body. It was, it was radical. It's why the people were so upset, why there was so much uh, animosity toward Paul and those who uh, brought Gentiles into fellowship. It was not easy for Jewish people to accept this, this new thing called the church. But the promise is to the church that Jesus will come. He being the bridegroom and the church being his bride. And uh, will come. And uh, not uh, that he comes as he did the first time to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, but this is a coming to catch us up. That, as the old gospel song says, there's going to be a meeting in the air. We won't be caught up. The dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be changed, 1 Thessalonians 4. And, and we are taken be with the Lord. It's at that point that uh, when the church is taken out, that there's seven more years of fulfillment of the 70 weeks that uh, Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Now, this is just to review what we talked about before. I used this diagram uh, a couple years ago when we did the study through the book of Revelation. But notice that it's uh, seven years separated into two halves. And, uh, and of course, that midpoint is that that was referred to in the passage for last weekend, the abomination of desolation, because after the church is taken, shortly after that, there will be the rising of, of an antichrist, a man of sin, who will be attractive to the world. He'll make a peace treaty with Israel. There will be a thing like what they've been longing for for so long, and, and it's dominated the news right now. Israel would love to be able to have, have peace, and they've given up, given up territory in order to try to appease those that, uh, uh, that are about them and just hate them and want to, to, uh, to annihilate them. It's been that way uh, for centuries. It, it came to a surface when, when that territory was given to them in 1948, and Israel once again became a nation. Uh, there's no real race of people called Palestinians. They're the same race of people as the Jordanians and those around them. But there's been this long hostility that they refuse to recognize that uh, this is a nation that has a right to exist. You won't hear, especially on, uh, on many news outlets, the, the fairness uh, even, uh, even represented because there is in the world a general negativity toward Israel. And uh, so Palestinians are often pictured as, as the victims of these things, even though they are just uh, on record as saying, we want to destroy Israel. We want to kill all the Jews. Now, that's part of what fits into what, what has been happening since Genesis 12 and God's promise to Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. And God has preserved and protected Israel for all of these centuries. And those that have tried to raise their uh, 
fist against God by attacking the, the people that have this unique covenant relationship have all passed from the sea. God said, I will bless him who blesses you, and I will curse him who curses you. And uh, so that's where it should be of importance to us as believers to, to uh, reflect that in our, in our voting and in our and what we support and how we pray for, because this nation will not will not <coughs> prosper or or do well at all if we become the enemy to Israel. Now that's a little bit of a digression, but I think it's important in view of the of the things that are uh, uh, on the news and some of the things that we even hear believers and some of the folks even in, in this church have said, not being aware of of how serious this issue is of, of Israel. Now, is Israel a godly nation? No. In fact, Christians who are there in Israel trying, Jews that are Messianic are persecuted in the same way they were in the Apostle Paul's day. I was there in 1997 and I have the pictures in a file of, a, of the charred uh, remains of a ministry that was trying to help Russian Jews moving into Israel, and it was Jewish people who firebombed their their warehouse. That's what this seven years will accomplish. Is what has not happened uh, to this point is that Israel as a nation recognized the Messiah that they uh, received once and rejected and put on the cross. So that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble this seven years. And, and that's a background to the reference of, of, of all of it discourse because it's it's being directed toward, toward Israel and those people who will be here toward the end of that time. Now, uh, that's why when I read it, I, I don't see myself in some of these things, but there are several principles here involved. One is, we can see uh, the certainty and be encouraged that God has everything under control as we see these uh, events all moving toward a time that would be easy to, for these things to be ushered in. There's a second somewhat parallel in that just as he uh, gives these words of encouragement and admonitions to be prepared for someone who is looking for the Lord's return, we are looking for the Lord's return as well, and the same things also apply to us. So, uh, when the fig tree puts forth leaves, Jesus says, only a short time remains till summer. And uh, so, future events cast their shadows before them. In Luke 21, it says, behold, this is Luke's account of the same uh, Olivet Discourse. He said, behold the fig tree and all the trees. And so the fig tree is Israel, but, but it encompasses all the nations as well. And uh, so this is something that uh, would be important to other people as well. Just before that, it said, when these things begin to take place, notice the words begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, for a person who is under severe persecution during that period of tribulation, this is a time God is about to come to, to rescue them from their time of trial and trouble. But uh, we uh, are seeing things begin to take place even at this point, I believe. What Jesus said here, this generation, as we back up now, but in that passage here uh, in Matthew 24, verse 35, even so, he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. He couldn't have been speaking of the generation that he was speaking to there at that day in about 30 AD, because uh, all these things that he's described, the abomination of desolation, the persecutions and judgments, the false prophets, the signs in heaven, Christ's final return, the gathering of the elect, that he's just, that didn't happen during their lifetime. Uh, that's something that will happen in the generation when these events, this seven year tribulation period, begins to unfold. But I could say that we have a, a sense of being 
here where we can see a foreshadowing. We aren't the ones that are looking for the signs, but we certainly see how the signs can very quickly and easily be ushered into place. If we're not looking for signs, what are we looking for? Well, Philippians 3, I heard it. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. That's what you and I in the church are, are looking for. There, there's no signs of the rapture. It's a signless event. We're looking for a Savior who said, I'm going to come, and it'll be at any time being ready for that to come. And so, uh, after we go is when the final labor pains begin, and that's when Christ's return is near or is at the door. But this little phrase here is something that, that should stay and, and resonate, and I hope would be one of those kinds of things that you could even memorize and meditate. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What a profound statement. Everything that we see of natural creation, and I enjoy looking at, at great photographs of scenery and see all that God has made and uh, the diversity and the intricate wonder as God displayed His handiwork. And ones we're, we've never exhausted what's here in, in the minutia of, uh, of natural creation here on earth, but then you add the heavens above that and all the incomprehensible distance and uh, and it just becomes greater and greater exponentially and grander but all these things will pass away but what is that which is established in the last he says one word will never pass away you know isaiah put it graphically and poetically in isaiah 24 to just describe what it's what's like when when this cursed creation is uh, passing away. He said, The floodgates of the heaven are open. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls, never to rise again. This is what sin has done to God's perfect creation. And there will be that judgment. And it will be a terrible time to be on earth when, when the wrath of God is poured out. In that day, Isaiah continues, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the earth and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon and will be shut out of prison and be punished after many days. God has it all planned out. Now, Peter puts it this way. Remember, this is just to go along with heaven and earth will pass away. Easy to say that expression and just let those words roll off our tongue and kind of smooth and pleasant. But heaven and earth will pass away. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now that's devastation like we've never seen before. <clears throat> now, how does that make me feel? Not very good about the things that I've all seen all my life. But on the other hand, it gives me a healthier perspective. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt the heat but in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. You see, this is the worldview we ought to have. Not that we're responsible to, to try to save the world, to make it last for eternity. This is what God's plan is. Now, we are caretakers and ought to treat it with respect because it's God's plan. But we recognize, too, that it's not the permanent abode for us, and that God only plans it like this body for a temporary time. I 
Isaiah 40 is one of the great chapters just to meditate on. If you want to just spend some time with the Lord, this is one chapter where you can't just read it through quickly. It's, uh, it's a great treatise all in itself. And uh, in verse 6 we read, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord stands forever. What a contrast. And again, we can be thankful and, and also a purpose that, that we treat God's word as being final and authoritative, inerrant. But this is this is God's book. It's His Word speaking to us. And I wouldn't want to be in a church as a pastor or as a member where people have loosened their conviction that this is God's truth. That it's alright, but, uh, but just a book. Nevertheless, we have to recognize that it speaks authoritatively to us. And sometimes when, when I'm dealing with issues in people's lives and say, does it matter what God says? And, or I point out, this is what the Bible says, and I hear the word is coming back, yeah, but, and there should be no, yeah, but, when we hear God's word, it's, it's final and authoritative. Heaven and earth passes away, my words will never pass away. Grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. So, may it that truth be established and may we never lose our character there. Now, um, we move from the budding victory to Noah. What is there about Noah that has anything to do with, with prophecy? He says, it's as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. It is, the emphasis is not so much on the extreme wickedness of Noah's day, even though the world was desperately wicked. You can read about it in, in Genesis 6-5, making God question whether he should have even put these people here, and he has a plan to bring judgment on the earth and save the one man and his family, the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But, that's not the, the point. He just says the way it was in Noah's day that people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Now, what's so bad about that? You and I eat and drink. We get married and give in marriage. Is, is this somehow suggesting that God wasn't happy with the way they ate and drank? Married and gave in marriage? No, it's it's just saying they were living life just in a mundane way, going through all of their activities. You're occupied with just what, what they were uh, doing in daily life. Meanwhile, there was a man named Noah, a preacher of righteousness, calling on them to repent, but they ignored him. And so the day came. But after all these years of Noah's preaching that they ignored, and the ark that he was building, which itself was a testimony to them, God collected the animals, and when they were all in there, the Bible says with finality, God shut the door, and then it began to rain, and the judgment of God came. Here the emphasis is on the fact that the people did not know the day when the judgment would, would come, but it certainly did. They had received their warning. And they had been warned and warned, but they just went about it as if it meant nothing to them. Peter made reference to this, and I hope you can read that and look it up in your Bible and put a lot of words on one screen there. But it says, if God did not spare angels when they sinned and sent them to hell, putting them in and gloomy dungeons be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, which is his wife, 
his uh, three sons and their wives. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he sought her. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to uphold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. So Noah and his family in the ark are a picture of God's miraculous preservation of Israel during this time of tribulation. The people who was in Noah's day went about the common interests of life, eating and drinking, getting married, they lost out of one of the best by really doing some good things. It's a dangerous thing to get so absorbed in the pursuits of life that we become indifferent to the Lord's voice. People are proclaiming the gospel now in this nation, in this community. And there are many who say, I've got a, a busy schedule for today. Or I've got my life all planned out. And my plans don't leave any place for the Word of God to speak into my heart and make any changes. I've got it all, all going this way, and I'll just do my life day after day and keep my routine. And what is the lesson of Noah? That God is long-suffering. He doesn't immediately step in and say, turn, here's where you're going to have to change if you're going to be spared judgment. He gives additional opportunity for them to hear, but then the day comes that judgment happens. And that's what the Lord is telling us with Noah. Now, the disciples wanted to fix the precise time. You know, when, when will this happen? And as he spoke about Noah, he says, you won't know the day or the time. Now, even after the cross and just before the ascension, ascension we come to Acts chapter 1 and again. They asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. So he hasn't given us a timetable, something like our travel itinerary that we can put into our calendar and know that on a certain day, Jesus comes back. There are people who have foolishly thought that they figured out and broken the code and uh, made predictions, and they can do all, all of them wrong to this point. And certainly the gospel suffers some lack of credibility to those who have listened to them and then put it all together, no, it'll never happen. Now, he taught this in parables. He says, this is how it will be coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Many times, reading through that, you say, well, that's that's the rapture. That's the day when the Christian will be here and not Christian. And poof, the, the Christian is gone. But he's just been talking about Noah and the fact that judgment will come at a time that people are not prepared. But that God knows how to protect and preserve the righteous while he takes away the ungodly, the wicked, in judgment. And so in this in this picture that Jesus is giving here. The one that is taken is taken in judgment, just as in Noah's day. There will be a time when believers will be caught up. That's the rapture of the church, but this is not the rapture. This is the tribulation time, and those people at the end of that will be perish in judgment, while others remain to enter the kingdom. If you remember the diagram there, Jesus will come in culmination and establish his kingdom here for a thousand years. Now, the third is the nighttime thief. Always be ready, is the lesson here, because the Lord will return at an unexpected time. And this is where I think it is 
that can apply to both of those coming. It's coming in the air as well as this coming to earth. We are called upon to be ready at any time. How grateful we ought to be that God has not appointed us to experience wrath. Jesus suffered, was condemned for us, so that we could be saved. And that doesn't mean that there won't be uh, difficult times and adversity. Uh, but he saved us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9 points that out. They themselves, the people who knew about the conversion of the Thessalonians, report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Because this is what we're doing right now. We've turned away from whatever our false trust was to God. Put our trust in him. Now we are waiting for his son from heaven. We're serving the living and true God, whom he had raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. As also said in chapter 5, verse 10, he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Did Jesus say we're never going to face hardship, difficulty, or, or tribulation in the sense of, of uh, adversity in life? Well, not really. In John 16, 33, I've told you these things, but in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. This means that uh, it is not to be considered an unnatural thing, that, that God forgot about you. If your tire's flat when you go out of here tonight, or, or, or you have bad news about health, or, or finances aren't the way you wish they were, or any number of things can happen. And we've been praying for, for those that are in prison and they're, different parts of the world because of their faith. God never promised that that won't happen to believers. Now I want you to think about the person who was influential in you coming to faith in Christ. And uh, as you think of that person, would you have been at all changed in your attitude towards this uh, life that they were offering? If you had just seen them stoned to death, or you thought they were killed on account of their faith. But then they survived it, and nothing you realize that's what it's like to live this Christian life. Well, that happened in the first missionary journey, journey for Paul and Barnabas. And they were had left Antioch, this is in modern day Turkey, and gone to the cities of Iconium, Ly Lystra, and Derby. And in Lystra, it a man was healed because they prayed for him. Everyone was going to worship them as, as Greek gods. But then, some troublemakers from the previous town came and convinced the people, and they stoned Paul, drug him out of the city for, and left him for dead. But either God raised him or he was just badly injured and unconscious. But then, it was after this that we read in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Strengthening the disciples as he goes back to the same cities and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, he says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Now, he wasn't just making that up. They had just seen some of the hardships of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So when we think, oh, we don't have to experience the tribulation period, He's not saying that there won't be tri tribulation in lives. These things I've written might have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. You'll have trouble. But be of good cheer, he says, I've overcome the world. So, as we leave off on this part for right now, here's the words of Christ. Here's what we would want to hear. What he says, and what he said in that context, he says, I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. Now let's go back again to what Peter said. And what was it that he said we actually do in view of the fact the world's going to be destroyed someday? 
there's going to be just a pour down a simple table who would mark him. It says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming up. It ought to have some application to, to our purity of life. It says, um, in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven, a new earth. It ought to instill hope into our hearts. And then in verse 14, it says, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Now, the purity is obvious. We don't. Sin is what brought all of this mess. And ought not to be considered a, an area that we can just kind of be casual with. But at peace with Him. Where, where does this come from? Since Genesis 3, so there's been enmity, there has been an adversarial relationship. That's why it's called the ministry of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We committed to this message of reconciliation, appealing to people, be reconciled to God. But there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ and coming to him. Put your faith in Him based on what He did for you in your place under the 